ghost room. Mark and Sarah stood on the creaking porch of their new home, a grand Victorian house that had seen better days. Its once beautiful facade was faded and peeling, and the windows seemed to sag under years of neglect. To them, it was a dream waiting to be realised, a chance to escape their cramped apartment and create something truly their own. As the moving van pulled away, they were approached by an elderly woman from next door. She was frail, her pale blue eyes full of worry. Don't touch the room on the second floor, she said, her voice a dry whisper. It's best left alone. Mark chuckled nervously. We'll take care of it, he said, brushing her off as he and Sarah exchanged bemused glances. The woman sighed and shuffled away, muttering under her breath. The renovations began immediately. Mark threw himself into tearing down wallpaper while Sarah worked on cleaning decades of grime from the ornate woodwork. The house was demanding, but every day brought them closer to their vision of a home. But the second floor room remained locked. Mark had tried the key that came with the house, but it wouldn't fit. It didn't bother them at first. There was plenty else to work on. We'll deal with it later, Sarah said. Later came sooner than they expected. At night, strange sounds began to echo through the house. Soft laughter, faint but distinct, would drift down the hallways. Footsteps could be heard pacing above them, always stopping outside the locked door. Shadows moved under the gap between the door and the floor, though there was no one there. Sarah woke one night to a faint creaking noise. She nudged Mark awake. Do you hear that? She whispered. They listened. The sound was rhythmic, a soft squeak, 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 like a rocking chair moving back and forth. It's probably just the house settling, Mark muttered, though his voice betrayed his unease. By the third week, they were both on edge. The noises grew louder, more frequent. Objects began to move on their own. A picture frame Sarah had hung in the hallway would be found on the floor every morning, always facing the locked door. The sense of unease became suffocating, and the couple avoided the second floor whenever they could. But curiosity is a powerful thing. One evening, Mark stood outside the locked door, a crowbar in his hands. Sarah stood behind him, arms crossed. Are you sure this is a good idea? She asked. Would you rather live in a haunted house forever? Mark said, forcing a grin. He wedged the crowbar into the doorframe and pushed. With a groaning crack, the door swung open. Inside, they found a room untouched by time. A soft layer of dust coated the floor, but everything else was pristine. A rocking chair sat by the window, gently moving on its own. A small wooden bed was neatly made, its faded quilt tucked in tightly. Toys were scattered across the floor, old-fashioned dolls and stuffed animals with glassy, staring eyes. The air was heavy, oppressive. It smelled faintly of lavender and something else, something sour and metallic. Mark, Sarah whispered, her voice trembling. Let's go, now. But Mark was transfixed. He stepped into the room, his footfalls muffled on the dusty floor. He picked up a doll, its porcelain face cracked its eyes fixed in a vacant stare. Suddenly, the door slammed shut behind them. Sarah screamed and lunged for the handle, but it wouldn't budge. Mark joined her, yanking with all his strength, but the door held fast. Why won't it open? Sarah cried, her voice rising in panic. Mark turned back to the room and froze. In the corner, where there had been only shadows, a child now stood. Her dress was tattered and old-fashioned, her skin pale as the moon, her head tilted slightly as she regarded them with cold, empty eyes. This is my room, she said, her voice soft but sharp, like a knife cutting through the air. Sarah clutched Mark's arm, trembling. We're sorry, she stammered. We'll leave. Just let us out. The child stepped forward, her bare feet silent on the floor. You shouldn't have come in, she whispered. Behind her, the rocking chair began to move faster, its squeaking growing louder and more erratic. The room seemed to shift, the walls darkened, 
the air growing colder and thicker. The toys on the floor began to move, crawling towards the couple with jerking, unnatural motions. The bed's quilt lifted slightly, as though something underneath it was stirring. Mark! Sarah screamed. Do something! Mark grabbed the crowbar and swung it at the door, but the wood absorbed the blow as if it were stone. The child laughed, the sound high and cruel. You belong here now, she said. The floor beneath them felt soft, like stepping on rotten wood. Shadows pooled at their feet, crawling up their legs like ink. The couple's screams echoed through the house, growing fainter and fainter until they disappeared entirely. The house returns to silence. The next day, the elderly neighbour stood on her porch, watching as a man approached the house, a for sale sign tucked under his arm. He stopped at the gate and frowned, scratching his head. The house looked abandoned, its windows dark and broken, its paint peeling even more than before. The new owners were nowhere to be seen. The rocking chair in the second floor window swayed gently, though there was no breeze, and from within, faint laughter echoed once again. The gift. Eleanor sat in her dimly lit studio, the smell of turpentine and stale coffee clinging to the air. The canvases stacked against the walls were her life's work, yet they remained unsold, unnoticed. Once hailed as a rising star in the art world, her name was now a faint whisper of a memory. The rent was overdue, her cupboards nearly bare. Despair hung over her like a storm cloud. As she slumped over her easel, a knock at the door startled her. She shuffled to the entrance, her joints aching with age, and found a small package on the doorstep. There was no return address, just her name in elegant flowing script. Inside, nestled in black velvet, was a golden locket. It gleamed as though freshly polished, inscribed with the words, To realise one's true potential. She opened it, revealing a small black stone, smooth and cold to the touch. A chill ran through her fingers as she held it. That night, Eleanor placed the locket around her neck. It was beautiful, and for reasons she couldn't quite explain, it felt right. As she fell asleep, she dreamed vividly. She stood before a blank canvas, her hands moving with impossible speed, painting something magnificent, something that would make the world remember her name. The next morning, she woke with a jolt, her pulse racing. She raced to her easel, grabbing her brushes with a fervour she hadn't felt in years. The strokes came effortlessly, each movement precise and inspired. Hours passed like minutes, and when she stepped back, she gasped. The painting was a masterpiece. It depicted a hauntingly beautiful landscape, the kind that seemed to reach into the soul. It was unlike anything she'd ever created before. Eleanor didn't understand how she had done it, but she didn't care. She had created art again. Within days, the painting sold for a fortune. Critics called it a revelation, and her name returned to galleries and articles, spoken with awe. Eleanor basked in the adoration, and the commissions poured in. Every new piece she painted was better than the last, and her fame grew. But with each painting, Eleanor began to see things. Shadows moved at the edges of her vision. Faces flashed across her mind, contorted in anguish. At first, she dismissed them as tricks of her imagination, the result of long nights and too much coffee but they grew more vivid. One night, as she worked on a new painting, the image of a young man appeared before her. His face was gaunt, his eyes pleading. Help me, he whispered. Eleanor screamed, dropping her brush. The figure vanished, but the echo of his voice lingered in her ears. The visions became more frequent and impossible to ignore. Strangers appeared in her dreams, their faces pale and hollow, Begging for help, Eleanor's hunger grew insatiable. Not for food, but for something deeper. She felt it gnawing at her insides, a craving she couldn't name. She tried to resist the locket's pull, 
leaving it on her dresser as she slept. But when she awoke, it was around her neck once more, its black stone seeming darker than before. Her success felt poisoned, each new sail accompanied by another vision, another voice crying out in the dark. Her friends noticed the change in her. "'Are you okay? asked Lily, a fellow artist and one of the few people Eleanor still trusted. "'You look... different.' "'I'm fine,' Eleanor snapped, though she could see the truth in Lily's worried eyes. Her skin was growing sallow, her cheekbones more pronounced. She felt weaker with every passing day, yet her art grew stronger, more mesmerising. She began to avoid people, unable to bear their pity, or the way their faces haunted her afterward. One night, Eleanor painted feverishly, her hands trembling as the brush danced across the canvas. The finished piece was her most powerful yet, a portrait of a young woman, her face frozen in a silent scream. Eleanor stared at it, tears streaming down her face. The woman in the painting was Lily. Her phone buzzed. It was a message from Lily. Feeling sick? Going to bed early? Call me tomorrow. Eleanor's stomach turned. The locket felt heavier than ever, its cold weight pressing against her chest. She grabbed it, yanking it off and throwing it into the fireplace. The flames roared as the gold melted and the black stone cracked. Eleanor collapsed into a chair, gasping, feeling the hunger begin to subside. But her relief was short-lived. Moments later, she felt a familiar weight around her neck. She looked down in horror. The locket was there, unscathed, its black stone glowing faintly. She stumbled to the mirror and froze. Her reflection stared back at her, but it wasn't her. The figure in the glass grinned, its eyes hollow and black as the stone. Its skin was tight and leathery, its teeth sharp and glinting. Eleanor clutched her chest, feeling her heartbeat slow as the reflection stepped closer, pressing its hand against the glass. The room grew darker, the locket's glow consuming everything. Eleanor's screams echoed through the studio, but no one heard them. The Final Masterpiece Weeks later, the gallery announced a new exhibition. Eleanor's final works, hailed as her greatest. Each painting was sold for staggering sums, but those who bought them reported strange occurrences, visions of suffering, nightmares of a pale figure with hollow eyes. The studio remained empty, save for a single easel. On it was a painting of Eleanor, her face twisted in a grotesque grin, her eyes dark and endless. The locket around her neck gleamed, its black stone a portal to something no one dared to understand. The visitor. The storm rolled over the hills, its thunder rattling the windows of Henry's farmhouse. Rain lashed against the glass in relentless sheets, and the old structure groaned as the wind howled through the cracks. Henry sat by the fire, nursing a glass of whiskey, the embers casting flickering shadows on the walls. Outside, the fields stretched endlessly into the night, their sodden earth hidden beneath the dark sky. It had been years since his wife Marjorie disappeared. The neighbours stopped asking long ago, accepting the farmer's terse explanations. She left, Henry would say, moved to the city, couldn't take the isolation. It was easier than telling them the truth. He pushed the thought from his mind, taking another swig of whiskey. Then came the knock at the door. Henry froze. It was past midnight, and no one ever came out this far, especially in weather like this. He set down his glass, grabbed a flashlight, and made his way to the door. Peering through the peephole, he saw a figure hunched against the storm, a tattered coat clinging to his thin frame. Reluctantly, Henry opened the door. The man stepped inside without waiting for an invitation, his boots leaving muddy prints on the floor. His face was gaunt, his eyes sunken, but he smiled politely. Terrible night to be out, Henry said his voice gruff. What brings you here? Car broke down a few miles back, the man replied, his voice calm but oddly flat. Saw the light from your window. Thought I might find shelter here. Henry hesitated, 
Something about the man felt wrong, but the storm was raging, and sending him back out seemed cruel. I've got a spare room upstairs, he said finally. You can stay the night. The visitor warmed himself by the fire, his pale hands outstretched toward the flames. Henry sat in his chair, watching him out of the corner of his eye. The man's coat dripped onto the floor, but he made no move to remove it. His eyes gleamed faintly in the firelight, catching the flicker of the flames in a way that seemed unnatural. "'You live here alone?' the man asked, his tone casual. "'Been alone for years,' Henry said, shifting in his seat. "'Just me and the farm. No wife, no family?' The visitor's eyes seemed to bore into him. Henry bristled. "'Had a wife once. She's gone now.' The visitor nodded, a strange smile playing on his lips. "'Gone,' he repeated, as though savouring the word. He leaned forward slightly, his shadow stretching unnaturally long across the floor. "'It must get lonely. All by yourself.' Henry stood abruptly. "'You'll want to get some sleep. Early start tomorrow if you're heading back to town.' The man smiled wider, his teeth unnervingly white. "'Of course. Thank you for your kindness.' Henry bolted the door to his bedroom that night, though he couldn't explain why. Something about the visitor gnawed at his nerves, like a splinter buried deep in his skin. He lay in bed, staring at the ceiling, listening to the storm rage outside. A loud creak echoed through the house. Henry sat up, his heart pounding. The sound came again, a floorboard groaning underweight. He reached for the shotgun by his bedside and crept to the door, easing it open. The hallway was empty, but the shadows seemed deeper, the air colder. He stepped out, his bare feet silent on the wooden floor. As he approached the stairs, he froze. The visitor stood at the bottom, staring up at him. "'Can't sleep, Henry?' the man asked, his voice low and mocking. He didn't move, but his shadow twisted and writhed behind him like a living thing. "'What do you want?' Henry demanded, his voice shaking. The visitor's smile widened. "'You thought you could bury the truth,' he said, his tone almost playful. "'But the earth remembers. It always remembers.' Henry's breath caught. His fingers tightened around the shotgun. "'I don't know what you're talking about.' The visitor tilted his head, his eyes glowing faintly in the darkness. Marjorie, he said, the name hanging in the air like a noose. Do you think she forgave you? Do you think the dirt could hide what you did? Henry's legs trembled. Get out, he growled. I don't care who you are. Get out of my house. The visitor took a step forward, his shadow stretching up the walls, filling the space with writhing darkness. I'm not here to leave, he said. I'm here for justice. Henry raised the shotgun, but before he could fire, the man's shadow surged toward him, enveloping him in cold, suffocating darkness. He screamed, the sound swallowed by the storm. The next morning. The storm had passed, leaving the fields glistening under the pale morning sun. The farmhouse was quiet, its windows dark. The neighbour, curious about the lack of smoke from the chimney, came to check on Henry. She knocked, but there was no answer. Pushing the door open, she found the house empty, the fire long dead. In the middle of the living room floor was a trail of mud leading to the door, and outside, to the fields. The neighbour followed the trail, her boots sinking into the soft earth. In the centre of the field, she found a fresh mound of dirt, the soil dark and disturbed. She hesitated a chill creeping up her spine. Beneath the mound, the earth whispered, its voice low and mournful. Henry was never seen again, and neither was the visitor. The cellar. The house stood at the end of a quiet cul-de-sac. 
its weathered exterior and sagging shutters, a stark contrast to the cheery home surrounding it. Laura had hoped the move would be a fresh start for her and her son, Jamie. A chance to leave behind the shadows of the past and build a new life. But from the moment they set foot inside, something about the house felt wrong. The air was heavy, stale as though it had been holding its breath for years. The floors creaked under their feet, and the faint scent of damp earth lingered no matter how many windows Laura opened. But what unsettled her most was the cellar door. It was locked, a rusted padlock, securing it tightly, and Laura had told Jamie in no uncertain terms to leave it alone. "'It's just an old storage space,' she said, her tone firm. "'There's nothing down there but dust and spiders. Stay out of it.' Jamie, at fifteen, had always been curious. He nodded, but his eyes lingered on the door, the padlock gleaming faintly in the dim light. As the days passed, Jamie's fixation grew. He swore he could hear faint sounds coming from the other side of the door, scratching, shuffling, and sometimes low whispers. When he asked Laura about it, she snapped at him, her voice sharper than he'd ever heard. "'I said stay away from it, Jamie!' she barked, her hands trembling as she gripped the edge of the counter. Jamie backed off, but his curiosity only deepened. He began to dream of the cellar, of dark, endless stairs, and something waiting at the bottom. The whispers grew louder in his dreams, calling his name. One rainy evening, Laura left for a late shift at the diner, and Jamie was alone in the house. The storm outside rattled the windows, and the lights flickered as thunder rolled overhead. Jamie sat on the couch, staring at the cellar door. The whispers seemed louder tonight, almost urgent. His gaze fell to the drawer where Laura kept the spare keys. He hesitated, his heart pounding. She'd never know, he told himself. Just a quick look. He needed to know. He found the key and unlocked the padlock, the rusted mechanism groaning as it gave way. Slowly, he opened the door, the hinges creaking loudly. A rush of cold, damp air hit him, carrying with it the scent of earth and something faintly metallic. The staircase descended into darkness, the light from the hallway barely reaching the bottom. Jamie grabbed a flashlight and began to descend, each step creaking ominously beneath his weight. At the bottom, the cellar was larger than he'd imagined, the walls were rough stone and strange markings covered them, symbols etched deep into the rock, glowing faintly as his flashlight passed over them. The air was colder here, biting into his skin. In the centre of the room was an old wooden box, its surface cracked and splintered with age. Jamie approached it cautiously. The whispers were louder now, coming from all around him. He knelt and opened the box. Inside was a figure curled tightly, its skin leathery and withered. It was vaguely human, but its proportions were wrong. Too long, too thin. Its eyes were closed, and its mouth was a gaping void, as though frozen mid-scream. Jamie's breath caught in his throat. He stumbled back, dropping the flashlight. It rolled across the floor, casting erratic shadows that danced across the walls. Then the figure's eyes snapped open, they were black, endless, empty voids that seemed to swallow the light. Slowly the figure began to uncurl, its limbs jerking unnaturally as it rose. Its head tilted toward Jamie, and it whispered his name. Jamie! Jamie fled, scrambling up the stairs, his heart hammering in his chest. He slammed the cellar door shut and locked it, leaning against it as he struggled to catch his breath. But the whispers continued coming from just the other side of the door. Then they moved. Jamie! He turned and screamed. The creature stood at the end of the hallway, its gaunt form barely visible in the flickering light. Its head tilted, and it took a step forward, its movements unnaturally slow and deliberate. Jamie! It whispered again, its voice echoing in his mind. He backed away, tears streaming down his face, but it followed unrelenting. Laura came home to find the house in darkness. The storm had knocked out the power and the silence was oppressive. Jamie? She called, 
but there was no answer. She found him in the living room, standing motionless, his back to her. Jamie? she repeated, stepping closer. Her heart sank as he turned to face her. His eyes glowed faintly, black veins spreading across his pale skin. Behind him, the cellar door creaked open, and the creature stepped into the room. It was taller now. Its gaunt frame cast in impossibly long shadows. You promised me, it said, its voice a low, guttural rasp. Laura's knees buckled. She fell to the floor, tears streaming down her face. No, she whispered. Please, no. The creature tilted its head, a grotesque parody of pity. A debt must be paid. It placed a skeletal hand on Jamie's shoulder, and he followed it obediently, his movements stiff and mechanical. Laura screamed as the creature led him back to the cellar, its eyes never leaving hers. The door slammed shut behind them, the padlock clicking back into place. The Final Revelation Days later, the neighbours noticed Laura sitting on the porch, staring blankly at the fields. She didn't speak, didn't eat. The cellar door remained locked, and Jamie was never seen again. But at night, if you listened closely, you could hear whispers coming from beneath the house. Whispers of promises made and debts collected. And sometimes, just sometimes, Jamie's name. <laughs>